Meshing together a human and a different animal, or giving anthropomorphic characteristics to a beast, or other simple ideas. This concept is prevalent in mythology and folklore, constituting a good chunk of all monsters out there. As such, part crocodilian humanoids are not absent from our collective imagination either. However, strangely enough, half alligator people seem to be far more common in contemporary fantasy than legends of the past. In fact, even the creatures we are going to discuss today are 20th century inventions. The Gator Man and the Alligator Man. They are technically two distinct beings, but are often discussed as one. The reason for this is rather simple. Both are obscure and relatively lacking in lore and history. They were allegedly conceived as part of modern American folklore and as such one could call them both cryptids. Yes, allegedly, you see what I mean by the end of the video. Regardless, there apparently were brief periods where they were all the rage with people consistently citing them, popping up in journals of their time. Or not. We only have proof for one, but I digress. While the stories of these two are rather short, they are nonetheless fascinating. It is perhaps best that we start with the Gator Man, which I will use as the mother creature for the video. Reports of this entity date back to the 1973-1978 period. Relatively recent, and yet the accounts have mostly stopped, save for the occasional vague claims on the interwebs. Most, if not all, witnesses saw the beast in the Newton Lafayette region of New Jersey. The creature does not have a detailed description, it is simply said to be a 5 to 6 feet humanoid alligator. Its hind legs are human like, which it uses to roam the coastline. Whether its posture is hunched over or completely upright, I was unable to find out, but it most definitely has the head of an alligator. Both of these anatomical features distance it from the alligator man, firmly establishing it as a distinct monster. The New Jersey Gator Man showed up at the time of a massive algal bloom event caused by human activity. Algal blooms generally happen following a massive increase in the nutrient content of the water, primarily nitrogen and phosphorus. Such a boost is most often the result of the excessive use of fertilizers or untreated wastewater entering the lake, river or even the sea. Capitalizing on the opportunity, numerous algae species begin to thrive and reproduce at an unsustainable rate with catastrophic consequences. Besides suffocating much of the wildlife, they also pose serious health risks to humans. The red tides were a hot topic, and many claimed that the reptilian person or persons were abominations born of pollution. Basically, a miniature, rather cowardly Godzilla that tried to punish humans by thrashing about near the coastline. Yes, the Gator Man wasn't exactly the most menacing of creatures. According to the original reports, the beast spent long stretches of time underwater, occasionally emerging to scavenge on the shore. Whenever it encountered a human, it quickly rushed back into the safety of the water. Some other accounts tell of its tendency to flail about. People would think a person is drowning, but when calling out to it, the gator man would stop, swim closer to the edge and reveal its alligator head. I guess it was marginally braver when surrounded by algae. So not exactly dangerous, in fact we cannot even be sure if it was a predator. There are no accounts of it eating anything, we can only guess it scavenged on land, but who knows what it could have been looking for, maybe a shred of credibility. Despite the lack of actual danger the creature posed, the unnamed journalist who compiled witness statements from unknown journals… <sighs> Take a deep breath, we can talk about this at the government conspiracy portion. So, the Gator Man is associated with a Native American creature, mostly due to it being mentioned in the original article. Apparently, the Lenny Lenape people have legends of a human-sized fish which was impossible to catch, not in small part due to its massive body. Additionally, the monster was rather cunning, capable of outsmarting its hunters, making it a rather dangerous critter to even try to pursue. If you are now scratching your head, trying to figure out why this unnamed beast and the New Jersey Gator Man are a single entity, you are not alone. Despite the confidence of the journalist claiming that they are likely one and the same, there is not much in common between the two. The former is a ferocious, smart, rather sizable fish, 
The latter is a rather odd and cowardly alligator that happens to stroll around on two legs. I also doubt the Lenin be had trouble differentiating a fish and an alligator. However, this obvious discrepancy is the main reason I think the legends might actually exist. That being said, I looked up a few books and articles on the mythologies and folklore of these tribes, and I was unable to find anything on this monster. Which is not to say it does not exist, as looking for something with a vague description and no name is not exactly easy, especially with no prior knowledge of the culture of these people. If you happen to know anything about this fish, I'd be really happy if you could share it in the comments. Let's get back on track though and see what else there is to know about our skittish crocodilian. It is worth noting that their heyday culminated in the official statement of a government employee. This gave the Gatorman an air of legitimacy and is probably the thing that generated its modest popularity among monster enthusiasts, if indeed the story is true. So, in 1977, Alfred Hastrak, who worked as the New York State Conservation Naturalist at the time, apparently tried to confirm its existence. He claimed that the scaled, man-like creature that emerges from the deep waters near the southern tier is indeed real. By his words, it appears at dusk from the red edge with the waters to forage among the fern and most covered uplands. He also added that the appearance of the creature was the result of the man-made ecological disaster of the region, theorizing that the red algal blooms created the abomination. Oddly enough, he is credited as a scientific researcher. Listen. 1977 wasn't that long ago to excuse his batshit idea of what algal blooms are capable of. If he had any level of credibility in the scientific community, he must have known how mutations really work and what the red tide's effects actually were. At most, the phenomenon might kill an alligator indirectly, not completely rewrite its genetics. Still, I'm hesitant to call him a phony, it is more likely that he lied for a reason he considered just. He might have attempted to use the publicity of the Gatorman to signal boost his ecological concerns. Alfred could have hoped that people might be motivated to do something against the water pollution to make the monster disappear or simply realize how serious the issue was. However, spreading misinformation in the hopes of soliciting positive change is not a great move. <sighs> Environmentalism is a great cause and a very important message, yet it is tarnished again and again by the worst kind of activism. This might not have been directly harmful, unlike what others have done, but I doubt it had a net positive effect for the cause. The best thing we probably got from this is unironically the legend of Gatorman. But I digress, this is just an idea for his motivation. Alfred Hastrak might as well have simply been an imbecile. If he ever existed, that is, but let's assume he did. For now. After the statement of the government official, the story would come to a complete halt. The sightings stopped by 1978, no more articles were released, and the so-called scientist fell completely silent about the matter. Maybe he was disciplined for the embarrassment he caused for his associates. Maybe the Fed has run its course and people get bored of the monster. Whatever the case, it appears that Gatorman was dragged behind the barn and promptly shot in the head. However, such a sudden shift gets the conspiracy theories juices flowing in some people. As it currently stands, the first-hand reports are inaccessible, scrubbed from any journal they might have appeared in. What remains is the unnamed journalist who collected the articles without crediting any sources. Well, I have not been able to locate that one either, so I had to resort to at best tertiary recountings of the incident, which does not bode well for the whole thing. While some might theorize that the lack of any evidence is the work of the US government trying to cover up the existence of a cowardly reptile person, it is equally if not more valid to ask a different question. Did these sources ever exist in the first place? I could not find anything about Alfred's Hastrak that wasn't in reference to the Gatorman. The algal blooms are documented to have occurred from 1968 through 1988 in New Jersey, but not much else can be proven beyond that. While I have a healthy amount of doubt, it is not impossible or even unlikely that alleged sightings have occurred. The Gatorman is not among the most outlandish cryptids. 
and it is possible that some people have misidentified regular alligators or made up stories to fuel the legend. Still, this all seems so isolated. I don't know, maybe we are ruled by Lizardmen and one of them had a bit of a laugh at our expense. Who am I kidding, Lizards would have done a better job. Regardless, while I made sure to present the whole ordeal as potentially fabricated, I myself am not sure what to believe. By which I mean whether the Gatorman hysteria was ever real, the humanoid alligator itself most definitely wasn't. But make of it what you will, maybe I just wasn't able to locate the proof that's out there. So we have covered the Gator Man, but there's still the Alligator Man, which stands in stark contrast to the first story. It is something tangible, so tangible you could actually touch it, or at least the pane of glass it is safely stored behind. Let me introduce you to Jake. He's a calf, combining the features of a young alligator and something resembling a human. It is probably the combination of a dead alligator, papier mache and wires with some added hair and the teeth of some animal. Not the most convincing example of a Jenny Hanniver, but the owner is quite honest about the purpose he serves. Jake is the main allure of a tourist trap managed by Junior Marsh, intuitively called Marsh's Free Museum. The half alligator, half something artifact is the central attraction among a number of other baubles and curiosities, including an eight-legged lamb, a two-headed cow, and a shrunken human head. Marsh bought Jake from an antiquities dealer for $750 in 1967 to serve as a good conversation starter, according to him. But it started far more than conversations, as it practically became the mascot of his shop with postcards featuring him selling by the tens of thousands. Nowadays postcards are little more than the relics of a bygone age, but there is still Jake thin merchandise up for sale. He wasn't an instant nationwide success though. The Alligator Man gained most of its fame when the Florida-based World Weekly News publicized a sensationalist article. It is mostly a collection of lies and exaggerations, but it got the job done. They theorized it was a missing link in human evolution and claimed that Jake was captured alive. They even had an expert for hire, Simon Shoot, one of the pieces of shit out there who pretend to be credible and lie for money. The degenerate even stated that a serious investigation was underway to get to the bottom of the mystery. Naturally, that was never the case. To Marsh's credit, the article was not his idea, and they even used Jake's picture from one of the postcards without his permission. The man never allowed for any in-depth examination of the gaff, likely because he is aware of what it actually is. The air of mystery is the main appeal of the monster's taxidermy creature, and he intends to keep the truth hidden. That being said, the official site of Marsh's Free Museum does feature the likely origin. The Alligator Man is presumably another piece of art produced by Homer Tate, a relatively well-known producer of fake taxidermies buying his trade in the mid-1900s. Credit where credit is due. I am quite pleased with how the museum treats Jake. They provide truthful information, but aim to keep the legend alive. And it is a fun legend, because there is more to it than just the gaff behind panes of glass. A few stories were published in a 2007 article by the Colombian. These are tales that were told to Marge by various visitors, who were likely talking out of their asses, but managed to create an amusing backstory. He apparently frequented a New Orleans brothel while still alive. Jake was often seen there, smoking cigars. He was also a performer, featured in a sideshow at a Texas carnival, answering yes or no questions with nods of his head. But that was only the beginning. He seems to have found his calling in show business, later participating in a drag show at a San Francisco club under the alias of Minnie the Mermaid. Which is the title of a Phil Harris song, but I doubt there is any connection there. Still, a relatively small, half reptile, half man creature performing in a spotlight with a mermaid costume would have been quite the sight to behold. You'd think it would have been newsworthy, but alas, these stories are just amusing shit made up by people, and they do not have to be more. Now, having two rather distinct entities in the same video does present a bit of an issue. One of these will have the usual treatment of getting a realistic rendition, while the other will probably never receive one. But I'm not too upset about that, in all honesty. I have already committed to using the Gator when as the mother creature for the video for two main reasons. Jake is a curiosity, a one-of-a-kind calf with a janky charm. 
Secondly, I'd have to butcher him to make a functional animal from the mess that is his body. The gator man, on the other hand, is almost functional right off the bat. We just need to find the right evolutionary path and tie some morphological and ecological features together. It also looks cooler, in my humble opinion. The spec evo part of this video will actually be quite straightforward for a change. There is a solid basis for such a creature if we go back far enough, and the design itself is not at all unreasonable. It's nice not having to design a walking pants this time. So around the late Triassic period there were a couple animals belonging to Crocodilomorpha that had shorter front limbs. This likely means that they were at least semi-bipedal. Terrestrial circus is one of the genera that encompass such creatures. This little guy had rather agile limbs, situated directly under the body. It was likely pretty fast, but the predominant theory seems to be that it ran around mostly on all fours with its butt held high. Not quite there, but on the right track. However, while we have more than 200 million years to make changes, there are better candidates for the ancestor of a realistic gator man. It is much too small anyway at around 70 cm. The better options are the Saltoposuchus and Hesperosuchus genera and their respective species. Both of these animals were around 1.2-1.5 meters in length, which is also a lot closer to what we need. In fact, now nah, let's focus on these guys first. So, Saltoposuchus was an interesting little beast. It had rather short front limbs and likely had a similar posture to theropod dinosaurs. It's no wonder they were misclassified initially. Hesperosuchus, on the other hand, has a more ambiguous design. It might not have run around like a theropod, but its little hands could have been very useful for grabbing or digging, while still allowing for the flexibility to be used as legs. As you'd expect, based on these reconstructions, they were carnivorous, hunting for small prey on land. Both of them could be a good choice, but with all that said, there are a few reasons I'd pivot towards the Hesperosuchus genus as the progenitor of Gatorman. First off, Saltoposuchus has very short front limbs already, meaning it was likely on the road to favor speed above flexibility and potentially already left the wetlands for fully terrestrial habitats. Hesperosuchus, on the other hand, likely inhabited areas around lakes and rivers, which means swift swimming would still have been a useful ability. Thirdly, this little guy is a better fit geographically. Now, I understand that a lot of movement can occur in hundreds of millions of years, but continents are shifting too, so our safest bet is to move with them. Well then, we have our baseline, the ancestral version of the gator man. Since these early crocodilians appeared well after the Cardian Blueville episode, there's quite a bit of time left for modifications before the next extinction event. And what is there to do? Well, relatively little beyond the change of stature. Back when I was discussing the original lore of the gator man, I mentioned that I was not sure about its posture. In fact, I cannot definitively say whether the 1.5-1.8 meters range refer to its length or height. Since we are talking about a skittish creature that walks on its hind legs, it is a safer bet to go with length. It is quite obvious that it is not an apex predator, as no hostile encounters were reported to my knowledge, with explicit mention that it forages among the fern and moss-covered uplands. Based on this, we can extrapolate that the front limbs are indeed used to search for food, moving rocks, digging dirt, grabbing whatever it finds, not unlike what Hesperosuchus could have used them for. As a side note, we are keeping the gator man a predator. I know the alleged government official allegedly said the word forage, but this is not exactly the best build for a herbivore, not only in terms of ancestry, but also the head. We will not mention alligators move one for fun, sure, but it is designed to have reach and grab things that want to run away, not to chew foliage. Either way, things it may find on the shores can be good sources of nutrition, like crustaceans, small mammals, or reptiles, perhaps eggs. But they are not exactly the easiest to feed on, and specializing for them does not reward the massive 3 to 4 meter bug we would need to replicate American alligators. Think Chinese alligators in terms of size, except a bit slenderer. This way we still get to match the lore, even if we need to rely a bit more on distance and poor visibility for people mistaking them for humans. Well, 
could be children. Still, it is also a fine reason as to why they flee when people approach them. They have more reason to be afraid of the big apes shouting in their guttural tongues. So we only need to increase the length of Hesper Circus a bit to match our version of Gatorman. They would need the extra length too, mostly in terms of the tail, as a hefty counterbalance is needed to keep them semi-upright without constant effort. I'd also make the already agile front limbs a bit more dexterous with longer fingers. Naturally there would be no need for opposable thumbs, but a better grasp and after hands go a long way when scavenging in the coastal muck. As for the head, honestly, the one on this reconstruction is not too far off from what I was thinking. The head of crocodilians is specifically designed for their ambush tactics. Their eyes and nostrils can be comfortably positioned above the surface, while the vast majority of the body is still submerged. However, this is not something that would benefit the gator men. The things they eat are either below the waves or on the shore with no need for sneaking about. These beasts would require forward looking eyes, a comparatively shorter muzzle that is more about crunching and tearing than locking down large animals, and a flexible neck that allows for surveying the ground. And we practically have the finished product, a more active crocodilian that evolved for a different lifestyle than the extant genera which is not a rarity in the history of our planet. Just think about the Quinkana, which was still kicking about during the Pleistocene in Australia. Now, the gator man definitely did not find an unoccupied niche, as many animals already do the scavenging that would be their bread and butter. However, it is quite a bit more sizable than those critters and has the advantage of bullying or even catching some of them. Our alternative Earth with actual gator men would likely lack a couple species that could not keep up with this natural order, but I don't think this beast is unlikely to make it by any stretch of the imagination. The one issue we have to account for though is their sudden appearance and disappearance. Well, issue is a bit of an overstatement as the answer is presented to us on a platter, the red tides. Such an ecological catastrophe will have quite the effect on aquatic animals, drastically reducing the abundance of prey. Being rather skittish, the gator men of the New Jersey area were likely frequenting habitats far away from humanity, hiding as best they could. They avoided detection, or at the very least, mainstream awareness for a time, but the algal blooms forced them to move. Streams and lakes closer to the big cities were places they stayed away from for a long time, but that consequently meant those were in a better shape than their depleted homes. And so, they fought of their nervous nature to satiate their hunger. As long as the waters were red with algae, they remained in the area and the locals encountered them on a regular basis. This environmental catastrophe did not last forever though. Once the situation improved and the mess of tiny plants receded, they could return to their old habitats, far from human civilization. Well, as far as they can get nowadays. And that's their full story. Wow. This might have been one of the smoothest videos I've done to date, in terms of spec evil at the very least. I still spent quite a bit of time seeing if there's any more info out there. Plus, Jake was a rabbit hole I did not mind jumping into head first. Regardless, I'll leave you with this. A creature I find rather neat, especially since it is not the mindless killing machine many monsters turn into. It is a big reptilian coward, but a cool one nonetheless. Thanks for joining me on this sequence of short journeys. Discord and Patreon links in the description for anyone interested in having a chat or supporting the series. New videos coming, as always, with the possibility of making more than one a month again looming over the horizon. Maybe. That was a lot easier when they were 10 minutes long. Anyway, hope to see you in the next one. Bye!